Well, hopefully this is going to be the last video for this particular segment. We've been talking about vaccination. Now, vaccination, yes, it's more complicated than what we're talking about. But as I said, the immune system is worthy of probably two different quarters of upper division classes at UCLA. Um, but we broke it down to just thinking about what B cells are doing. B cells are kind of like genius nerds with not very much good sense. But if you present them with a problem like, here, I have got this virus that's causing trouble, they will go to work and they'll go, oh, I think I can invent something. Now, what a B cell invents is always going to be a protein called an antibody. But the antibody that what a B cell makes that will stick to this kind of flu virus, that particular antibody won't stick to that kind of flu virus. And that is why we have to get vaccinated for every individual strain of the flu. And that's why having had other coronaviruses in your lifetime doesn't protect you against this particular COVID-19. So we learned that B cells, really simplifying it, they're hanging out there in the lymph node, do 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 do, not doing very much. And then a macrophage or dendritic cell that's just come from some kind of a battle with COVID comes rushing in from the lungs and goes, ah, oh, this is something really important. Here, how many different weapons can we make against this? And that would be the, the, the stimulus that is going to get some helper T cells to, to say, I'm going to help you recruit a B cell. And the, together, the helper T cell and the dendritic cell, they're going to recruit a B cell by presenting antigen. Oh, look, antigen. And once that B cell has committed to making a weapon against that particular antigen, which is generally going to be part of a virus or a bacteria, then it is going to transform itself into a plasma cell. I got a picture of a plasma cell in a second. And then it is going to start to make proteins called antibodies. Antibodies are going to be those special weapons. So here is what the dendritic cell or macrophage that used to be a monocyte, here's what it's doing. It is going to consume antigen. Like what is the antigen it's consuming? It might have eaten up uh, a dead cell that was filled with virus. It might be eating up uh, a dead bacteria or it might be eating up a live bacteria that is, um, and then killing it. And once it does that, it is going to dismantle it. It's going to destroy it and rip it apart into little tiny pieces. Each little tiny piece of that bacteria or that virus could be considered an antigen. Is it an antigen? If the immune system can actually recognize it and make an antibody against it, yes, it's an antigen. If it's a part that the immune system can't recognize, then no, not an antigen. An antigen isn't necessarily anything bad. An antigen just is a little tiny molecule that can be recognized by your immune system. So it's going to dismantle things. A lot of it, it is just going to spit it all out. It's like, okay, but it is going to take some kind of an antigen and present it on, sorry, present it on the surface and say, can you make a protein, an antibody that would stick to this? If you can, Let's get together with a helper T cell and let's make the magic happen, okay? So when this system works, it takes time to work. It'll take a week to 10 days for your immune system, best case scenario, to make antibody that can destroy anti an, an antigen, all right? So let's look over here at the beginning. This might be the very first day that you get exposed to COVID, right? And after about three to five days, you start to feel sick. And that's when your immune system starts to do its work. If your immune system is doing its work really well, then maybe by day five, maybe by day seven, maybe you've got a pretty good amount of antibody around. But I want you to notice that this stuff does not happen overnight. You know, if you have to wait 
until you actually catch the flu, it is going to be a week or maybe 10 days before you have a significant amount of antibody floating around in your plasma so that you can actually start to win the war against this particular virus, right? And the truth is, it won't be until about two weeks before you get super high levels of antibody in your bloodstream. This stuff takes time. All of that stuff of upsetting the dendritic cell, the dendritic cell goes in, the dendritic cell eats stuff up, the dendritic cell goes back to the lymph node, the dendritic cell presents antigen, all of that stuff, it takes a lot of time. Now, when a person gets vaccinated, then all of this stuff happens in the week to 10 days after you get the vaccine. But if you catch a head cold, if you catch the flu, the reason you're pretty much always going to be sick for a week to 10 days is because that's how long this stuff takes. Here's the great thing about vaccination. Uh, I get my flu shot every year, as you can imagine. So in a week to 10 days after I get my flu shot, I've got that much antibody roaming around in my bloodstream, okay? That's how much antibody I have. But if I get exposed to that strain of the flu, um, you know, a month later, then within, within, you know, two days, I have got more uh, antibody than I need to fight off this that particular virus, and I never even get sick. The reason why we need to find a way to vaccinate people against the coronavirus, this COVID-19, is if we don't have vaccines, then that means pretty much over the next few years, every person on the planet is probably going to end up catching the COVID-19. If we don't end up with a vaccine, then the only solution will be for slowly everyone to catch it. Now, you might be hiding in your house and you're like, well, if everyone's got to catch it, uh, why don't we just get it over with? The reason we don't get it over with is because this particular virus, uh, particularly for the elderly, has got between a four and 20% uh, mortality rate, meaning, with, with the elderly, depending on how old they are and whether they've got other health problems like type 2 diabetes, um, 10 to 20% of them will die. Even more would die if we didn't have really good health care available for them. And you're thinking to yourself, yeah, fine, give them good health care. The truth is that the way American hospitals are set up, we can only take care of a certain number of these profoundly sick patients at a time. If over the next three years, all Americans end up cycling through this virus, then we may be able to give good quality medical care to everyone. But if all of the people in the United States got sick within the next six months, we just cannot take care of that many patients at American hospitals at the same time. And so we would have to say, we are only going to treat the people who are most likely to survive and everyone else you're on your own. That, that would just break our healthcare system and it would so profoundly change our experience of our society. We just don't wanna go there. So we're all uh, trapped inside of our homes, not only because we don't wanna get sick and we don't want our family to get sick, it's because if we can make it so that patients with COVID that need hospitalization, they dribble out there needing to be hospitalized a few at a time over the next three years, we can give everyone good quality ICU care. If we slam our hospitals with all of these patients at the same time, we're going to have to choose who gets medical care and who doesn't. We don't wanna do that. This is what a B cell looks like when it's convinced to turn itself into a plasma cell and it starts making antibody. Antibodies are proteins, right? What organelle in the cell makes proteins? Ribosomes do. What organelle 
makes proteins that are going to be exported, rough endoplasmic reticulum, and look at all of the rough endoplasmic reticulum a plasma cell has when it's uh, busy making antibody. Our immune system is capable, it has been calculated, of making as many as a trillion different antibodies. One of them is going to be against this coronavirus. Now, what does an antibody do? Antibodies are proteins. And the most common one is IgG. And IgG looks like this one that you see in front of you. It looks like a Y. And what does it do? It sticks to stuff. Are you kidding me, right? How is that useful? You can just imagine that like the reason you will live or die is because you've got a protein that will stick to this virus. Does it kill it? No, it doesn't kill it. Does it make it explode? No, it doesn't make it explode. It just sticks to it. How is that helpful? Here's how it's helpful. You can think of your antibodies as working the same way that Spider-Man's uh, Spider-Man web works. Does Spider-Man's web uh, kill people? No. Does it make them explode? No. Is it poisonous? No, right? All Spider-Man's web does is stick, but that's the same as our antibodies. So let's think about Spider-Man's web and let's talk about neutralization, right? If a virus is like COVID-19 is going to infect your cells, it's because it has got special proteins on the outside that will stick to the cells of your respiratory tract. And when it sticks there, it'll invade your cell. One of the things that antibody against COVID-19 can do is it just sticks all around the outside of every one of the virus particles. And now the virus particle can't invade the cell. That would be sort of like, sort of like if there was a really angry pit bull chasing Spider-Man and Spider-Man could just go and the web would wrap around the dog's nose and then the dog couldn't bite Spider-Man, right? Neutralization, right? Let's go from there and talk about agglutination. Agglutination. Agglutination, let's imagine Spider-Man was being attacked by 20 ninjas. Spider-Man's good, but 20 ninjas, come on. All he has to do is use his spider web and he wraps those 20 ninjas all together into a big glump of ninjas. And then the ninjas are defenseless and the local police department can come pick up the glump of ninjas and take them away. Glumping things together so that they are harmless is called agglutination. And agglutination will happen when your immune system makes antibodies against bacteria or against virus particles and just makes them all stick together. And then they're not effective because they're all glumped together. Precipitation is really the same thing as agglutination. It's just that agglutination is what happens when the antibody sticks together a bunch of cells or viral particles. Precipitation is what happens when antibody uh, sticks to poisons like rattlesnake venom. Did you know you can get vaccinated against rattlesnake venom? And then if a rattlesnake bites you, you won't die. That's crazy, right? Anyway, the way that happens is antibodies are made against the venom and then it causes the precipitation of the venom. And when the venom is not diluted in water, it, it can't harm your cells. The last thing antibody can do is what's called complement fixation. An antibody can make it so that it surrounds cells like, like bacterial cells in a way that attracts neutrophils to them and macrophages to them much more efficiently. So that's how antibodies work. There are different types of adaptive immunity. There is antibody immunity that we've been discussing, but there are also is something called cell-mediated immunity. And with cell-mediated immunity, that is specific to a different type of lymphocyte, lymphocytes that turn into killer T cells. And I'm sorry, we just don't have time to talk about all of that, right? The last thing we need to discuss in this module is autoimmune disease. We've already discussed one kind of autoimmune disease. Autoimmune means your immune system, instead of attacking the bad guys, 
is attacking you, right? That is not the way things are supposed to happen. And in our battle analogy, it's like friendly fire when you get killed by your own guy's bombs. One type of autoimmune disease we've already talked about is type one uh, uh, sugar diabetes, where your own immune system destroys your own beta islet cells. We also have talked about multiple sclerosis, where your own immune system are attacking your own myelin sheets. That shouldn't happen. Neutrophils are not to blame for this. T cells and B cells, they are not wise. If they get tricked into thinking that there is an antigen that needs antibodies or a T cell immunity response made against it, they will do it. So they will arm themselves and create weapons against anything that they've been told is dangerous. In a situation where uh, you've got type one diabetes, they obviously have been told at some point that whatever it is about beta islet cells is dangerous. So they will destroy it. Allergies, particularly allergic asthma, are also an example, not of autoimmune disease, but of a mistake that your T cells and B cells are making. In the case of being allergic to peanuts, so much that you'll almost die, um, the T cells and B cells have been tricked into thinking that not only are, P B are peanuts dangerous, they're so dangerous they should explode a nuclear bomb in order to kill them. And then the truth is that whatever you're inhaling, whether it's pollen or dust mite stuff, or it's not that dangerous, what's causing the problem is actually your immune response to something that's basically harmless. For your exam, make sure you recognize that that autoimmune disease, allergies, allergic asthma, these are mistakes that your immune system is making. So these are problems that are caused by your immune system, even though your immune system is supposed to solve problems, not cause them. All of these immune problems are more common in industrialization industrialized nations like the United States and most European countries. All right, this is our battle metaphor again. We're going to wrap that up. The last thing I wanted to mention was that when you're looking at a patient's blood test, when neutrophil numbers are elevated, that may indicate a bacterial infection. When lymphocytes are very low, it's not listed here, but one of the symptoms of COVID-19 infection is a very low lymphocyte count. And that may be because they are dying while they're trying to fight off the virus. And when you've got really bad hay fever or allergies, you will see too many eosinophils in the blood count. All right, that's it. On to our next topic.